I feel like my relationship with the divine is so strong. It's, I, I am a channel for it. And I'm realizing that that's what I am meant to be doing, what I'm meant to be. If you were to say one word that would describe your core intention for yourself, what would that word be? Devotion. Mm. Why devotion? Because devotion is, I think, where it all circles back to, is, is the realization of the divine, is the realization of something greater than us. And then it's a full commitment to go towards that. Hello, beautiful souls, and welcome back to The James Zander Trip. Today's guest is a consciousness explorer, entrepreneur, mentor, space holder, and curator of transformational experiences. He's passionate about spirituality, plant medicine, and self-improvement. But what is most alive for him right now is curating spaces and creating containers where people can dive deep into their soul and into the facets of their personal journey. He also holds the distinction of being my very first guest on the James Zander trip, and I'm so happy to have this beautiful human back in the studio for round two. Please welcome the one, the only, Jacob Grichar. Thank you so much for having me back. Such an honor to be here. You know, I was thinking about our first episode and how it could not have gone better. And I wanted to express my gratitude and appreciation for being vulnerable, being open, being present. You brought out the presence in me and it was everything I wanted the first episode to be. Mm -hmm. And it set the tone for the podcast. My vision for the podcast was fulfilled in that episode and it set the tone for the rest of the episodes. So I'm very grateful, massive appreciation to you for that. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, and I'm excited to go even deeper this time. Yes. So since we last spoke on the pod, what has been the deepest transformation that you have experienced in your life? Mm, and there have been so many, to be honest. It feels like I've lived an entire lifetime since the last, last time we spoke. Um, I moved countries a few times. I let go of everything I had in a country, of a relationship, of a house, of all the animals. Um, I started two new companies where we dive deep in the integration, um, where we support a lot of different transformational experiences. And um, yeah, it's been a journey. It's been massive upgrades the whole time. So each step of the way, I had to look at myself and be like, wow, this is an entirely different version of Jacob. Um, it's hard to pinpoint to one specific experience, but I say what has been the most alive for me was really holding myself accountable owning my own experience, really, mm, li really taking this accountability for being there for myself and holding safe space for myself as well, the way I hold it for others, creating my own containers and going really deep in my personal journey. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that, the accountability. <laughs> How do you hold yourself accountable? You develop habits. Um, you develop habits of checking in with yourself. So the way you would do, imagine being with a best friend and you can both commit to something that you're growing together. Let's say you both have the same spiritual purpose, the same dharma, and you will be checking in on each other because you love them so much and you care about their growth. And the same way we want to hold space for ourselves. And that has been one of my biggest lessons is because I'm so used to holding space for other people that I often neglected myself. And now coming back, full circle, back to myself, it created this whole new relationship with who I am. And I've learned to work with myself as I would work with other people. So checking in with myself, hey, how are you doing today? What's your energy like today? What do you want to experience out of today? Have you achieved these things that you decided in your vision board, in your goals that you want to get to? And then really holding myself accountable for not doing it in case I slack, in case I don't do it. Like, hey, how can we make this work? How can we celebrate you if you need to be celebrated? And then how can we support you in case you need to be supported? So the old version of Jacob, how did he show up in those situations differently? 
the old version of Jacob, meaning who I was a year ago. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, How was he not being accountable? And what, what was the turning point for you where you're like, okay, now I'm going to be more real with myself. I'm mm -hmm. going to hold myself to a higher standard. I'm going to check in with myself the way I do with other people. I think that something I've probably spoken about last time, I don't remember if I did, but I definitely spoke about it with the conversations with you, um, is that the way I have lived my life was very much experience to experience. So whatever the universe has brought me as a lesson that was right in front of me is what I chose to really dive deep in. And in this space, I didn't really feel the need to hold myself to a really high standard because I found places of growth wherever there was depth. And instead of developing specific habits and like actually tracking them and keeping, you know, them going like further and further and like developing and building on top of them, I would, I would go with whatever was present there. So if that was a love relationship, I would move to the other side of the world for them. If that was a calling that I had to the jungle or to the medicine, I would follow the calling. And it's a really beautiful way to live. It's really freeing. It's really liberating. Driven by inspiration. Driven completely by inspiration. I've just noticed that in those moments, I would quite often not hold myself accountable to do certain things that I know that they're right for me. For example, just checking in with how my body is feeling. I was so used to pushing myself to extremes. Motorbiking through Vietnam and Thailand and skydiving and going in the Amazon and drinking ayahuasca every other day. And it came to the point where my body just started recognizing that, oh, that is actually not what is the best for me. Because when we reach for these transcendental experiences over and over again, it's super nice. And we feel that it brings us closer to God, and it does for a brief moment. But then bringing that into your life and actually being a better human, being a better human to yourself, to others, actually showing up and being able to function in the current economic system, in the, in the way you interact with other people on a social level, cognitive, emotional, spiritual, all this is something that really needs to be like integrated. So all these profound experiences, they're incredible. And yes, they do bring us closer to God, but let's bring God closer to ourselves and closer into our lives. And I've often thought about this because there is this desire in me and I think in everyone to like just drop everything and go to Antarctica or go to Peru or go somewhere um, in that present moment, in that inspiration sense and not have any structure total freedom. There's something very alluring about that, which I'm sure you have felt. And then, like you say, there is the, you come to a point where you think, okay, I actually need some structure in my life. But too much structure then starts to feel confining, mm. starts to feel boring, matrixy. What is the balance for you that you've discovered that works really well, where you're not so structured or maybe you are, but I'd love to hear from you. Like, what, what is that balance? What is the exact perfect amount of structure? The exact <laughs> ratio Just to the T. Give us the recipe. Percentage. <laughs> I think it's 61% structure. Okay, no. you heard it um, here first. 61%. <laughs> trademark. Love it. Um, I feel like for me, um, for me, a perfect amount of structure is where... See, and this comes a lot to the balance of the masculine and feminine. It's something that's alive in all of us. Yes. So when we are very feminine, when we stepped into our femininity, into the flow, into the dance, we, we tend to go with our intuition. We tend to go with guidance. Feminine is more invisible. It's connection with this spiritual, mystical world. And not defining men being masculine and women being feminine, but both having both. It's we the can energies. See, yeah, it's the energies. And I saw that energy in myself, very strong feminine, um, going for the experiences, moving with inspiration. And also plant medicine is such a, such a feminine path. The surrender. Well. It's the surrender and it's also the, the mother nature, the connection with the nature, doing offerings, rituals, um, the beauty way. The gifting economy and the beauty way, beauty way. I love that. The beauty way. Yeah. Interesting. Something coming from North America. Um, but I feel like finding the balance with that is realizing the masculine in that as well, where 
The masculine is actually setting the tone and creating the container for the feminine to be able to experience itself. And we can see that, I can see that in the ways we curate containers, the way we lead retreats, the way we lead ceremonies. You can only go as deep as you feel safe. Mm. So if there is, if the container is not held properly, if there's people coming in and out of the room, if we're somewhere in the city and we don't know if somebody is going to knock on the door or the neighbors are going to complain about the noise, in the ceremony, we actually cannot like really reach this point of surrender and really go as deep in our own inner journey or in our own shadow as we would have gone otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that can create a lot of setback, a lot of walls, a lot of boundaries. So the masculine is in charge of really holding those containers safely. And by doing that, the feminine can actually like express itself more. And when we implement some sort of structure in our life, I used to say that discipline is the highest form of self-love, um, where when we acknowledge that with this certain amount of structure, we're actually giving ourselves so much freedom over time. For example, if I go to the gym every day, for example, or go for a run or whatever movement calls us, yeah. then I know I'm giving myself freedom for years to have a healthy body. But if I don't give myself this structure and I only move with inspiration and flow, it's just not sustainable. So this masculine and the feminine need to find a dance where they can actually balance itself out. And yes, it's so beautiful to move with inspiration. It's so beautiful to just go with the flow. Um, I find for me, the perfect balance comes when I can actually hold space for myself to experience things as deeply as I need to, as deeply as I want to rather. And then also being able to hold myself accountable and holding myself down and actually integrate whatever I am taking from this experience into everyday life, into actually, you know, having a set container where I can explore the depth to which I want to go. Yes. And then when that container closes, we move on, we move forwards. And it's like, it's a bit of structure, still within the medicine world, still within the world of breathwork, a world of transformation. But it does create this safe space for ourselves to like really, really go there. Is there something that the listeners can do to create better containers for themselves in their life, to hold space for themselves? It's a great question. That's something that's very individual, I find. Um, so a really important thing for me is to really check in with myself and scan my body and be present with whatever is happening around me and then realize what is the right amount of structure that I need to actually thrive. Something that's really good is creating plans and setting goals and journaling, which I know that from my personal experience, a really good friend of mine and my mentor took me through this exercise not so long ago where he made me define my five-year plans. And that was so confronting to me because I've never done that before because I don't think in structures. I don't think in plans for five years ahead. I don't think in numbers and businesses. And for me, it's all what manifests itself through the energy. So for me to actually create that structure for myself was quite confronting. And I found that when I did with a few other people, specifically with other women, mm. um, that was very confronting for them to set a certain amount of money that they want to be making, to set a certain amount of structures of goals that they want to be making. It's very much of a masculine path. And even though we might feel a little bit of resistance towards that, I think it's so important to do that as well. Yeah. So to set goals, to have certain vision, to have certain steps that are going to take us there, and then to journal, to really ground this down, to write it down. That's one, one way of creating structure. And then for creating containers, it comes from there. It's like where we actually need to go in our journey. What do we need to explore? Finding out these spots that are deep, that are needed to be moved in any sort of way. And then setting the space that feels the safest for us. So that can mean whatever for different people. For me, where I feel the safest is normally when I'm alone somewhere in nature. And that's my space where I know that there's not going to be people coming in and moving through. And um, I work really well with sound. So for me, if there are some instruments involved, I can take myself on my own journey really deeply. Right. And I think this is an important thing to, 
to talk about when we're talking about specifically with your podcast about psychedelics or with any sort of transformational work is like how far can you take yourself as well yes yeah. yes you know for me i i often do trips alone these days because i can go so much deeper mm -hmm. when it's a solo trip and that's happening because you trust yourself because you know yes. yourself because you've explored and experimented yeah it's a lot of exploration when it comes to knowing your own right feet yes and there's nothing greater than knowing yourself and i think it's a lifelong journey but you come to a point where you know yourself so deeply that the decisions become easier the mm -hmm. trust becomes deeper and then you can fully surrender to something like a psychedelic experience i want to go back to that resistance that you mentioned where you were confronted with the five-year plan Hmm. Describe to me, like, where do you think that resistance is coming from in you or in other people when they're confronted with that? Mm. I think a lot of resistance is coming from the limiting beliefs, from the beliefs we hold towards, uh, often, often they're sh a shadow. So what Carl Gustav Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist, was describing as shadow is anything that is either unseen or denied and repressed in the subconscious. So quite often we have these patterns that we aren't even aware of, which in majority of people, it's actually the feelings of unworthiness, of not feeling good enough. Um, for other people, it might be these subtle beliefs that were pushed upon them by their, their parents. For example, money is bad, money is the root of all evil. Um, if you go for this, you are therefore bad. And these limiting beliefs are very present for us whenever we try to up-level wherever we want to go. So if we're really looking for this next step in our evolution, if we don't confront our shadow first, it's going to keep blocking us from any sort of evolution. My friend calls it the gremlin. It's mm -hmm. like, as soon as you try to go a level above what your self-worth is, you'll sab self-sabotage yourself somehow. It's like the gremlin comes out. Exactly. That, that could be the shadow. Yeah, that could be the shadow as well. Um, so my particular resistance with this was I felt my belief, which I'm still not sure if it's a limiting belief or not, but my deep trust in the universe was in complete surrender, was the feminine path, the beauty way, was the, the fact that I knew everything is going to take care of itself in exactly the perfect way. And I still completely trust that. I completely know that. But at the same time, I've noticed that because of these beliefs I had around my self-worth, I was unable to actually structure where I want to go. So in a way, allowing myself to fully surrender into the journey became a bit of a coping me mechanism, a bit of an escapism. Interesting. Um, so instead of pushing for what I know I want, it became, it, it became a bit of bypassing in a way that I allowed myself to just go with the flow instead, to just be with whatever's more present for me, to actually like give all of my energy to things that I knew were not beneficial for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a great point. And I think so many people hear that and resonate with that is that you are the director of your life. And yes, the universe will deliver something maybe even better than mm -hmm. we expect. And, and there will be miracles and surprises and delights along the way. Mm -hmm. But to be that conscious creator and direct and say, this is what, what I would like in five years. Mm -hmm. Let's make it happen. Yeah. I think that that is the such an important piece of it. And I love that you said like the bypassing of like, well, I'll just flow with it and let's see what happens. I mean, you can also flow while directing. Exactly. And that comes back to the holding the structure for yourself to go deeper mm -hmm. and to go further. Because you are giving yourself structure and then the feminine is so much stronger than <sighs> the masculine. Yes. And it does break the structure. And that needs to happen. That's a step in evolution because the structure that you said is also limited to your mind. Structures are mind. I mean, they're also energy. Um, but at the same time, the, the universal power of whatever is meant to happen does eventually become larger. 
So it does end up breaking the structures and giving you more as long as you're really willing to face yourself and do this inner work. And I think for me, it also comes back to really owning my own experience and taking responsibility for how I want to live and what I want to create. And also, it's nothing is really linear when it comes to this. Everything is like, it's a circle, it's a spiral. So we tend to observe how we bypass and then transcend that and move further and create more things. And then we just spiral back into bypassing. And it's important that we catch ourselves. No matter where we are on the spiritual journey, there is nobody, at least that I know, that is fully enlightened. So we're all coming back in these circles. Even people that are teaching this, even people that are holding space, I think it's really important to understand that we also go through these same spirals. We also find ourselves bypassing and then realize, oh, the way I have been doing things might not be the most beneficial for me in the future. And then it's like, the ego is the one that says, I know. And the divine is, the feminine is the one that really like accepts that there is further steps in evolution. Mm. So if I find, catch myself bypassing in any way and I hold on to this, that I am right and I'm doing the right way and I try to find all this justification for why I'm doing my own thing in the way that I'm doing it, I'm, I'm holding on to the, I know, I'm holding on to the, my way is the best way. And that really limits the growth as well. So it's also understanding that when the structure breaks, it's just a step in evolution because we're going further. Right. So when you're in a space of, I know, I know, how do we break that? Is it by saying, I don't know? Oh, wow. It's actually by accepting that we don't know anything. I think anything that is said with so much conviction that people themselves who are saying it and people who are following that accept it as a truth is probably just some form of a hologram that needs to be broken. Mm, mm -hmm. Because if we think about the education system, and I think we touched briefly on that topic in the last podcast, is like how much of that information is actually factual? The science is just catching up on these ancient technologies and teaching. But also where did they come from? Who gives them the permission, let's say, to dictate what knowledge is? And our whole entire society is so masculine, it's like, it's, it's so egoic, let's say. It's um, the teachers in school will, with so much conviction, tell you this is the way the world works. And then if you don't follow and learn exactly what they say, if you think with your own head, with your own intuition, if you like really feel your own discernment and realize that that's not true, they say that you're wrong, you get an F. And so the society becomes built on people thinking that they know based on something else that somebody else told them. And then they are taught to say that with so much conviction. And this is our authority in the world. It's like the more convinced I appear that I know, the more people follow and the more people pay money and the more we get social media influence and all of that bullshit. Whereas in reality, it comes down to accepting that we don't know anything. Everything that we've been taught in school, drop all of that. Mm. Everything you've been taught through lineages of whatever teachings. Yes, there's some truth to it, for sure. But you are your own inner guide. You get to choose what your truth is. And that comes from personal discernment. That comes from like really understanding where you are and being able to, to navigate that, to direct that, to realize what's actually right for you. I want to circle back to the shadow work. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you had to do a lot of shadow work to discover these things. And I'm curious how, how that was for you and what processes you use for your shadow work. I highly recommend working with a therapist. Mm -hmm. mm. I don't have a specific therapist, but in my circle, there's quite a lot of people who work with psychedelic integration, who work with clients, psychologists, psychotherapists, and... They're used to pe taking people quite deep. And I think I'm very lucky to have this circle around me, my, my innermost circle. What were some of the things that you discovered you were rejecting in yourself? Mm -hmm. 
I was rejecting. I was rejecting fully feeling grief. I was rejecting fully stepping into my teacher and mentor role. And if I just comment a little bit on the last one, that that is something that really manifested in one of the last retreats that I've led, um, where I set quite a lot of facilitators, which the way I, I created the retreat company was I, wa I wanted to highlight people who are the best at, in the world at what they're doing. And all my social media, all my promotion, it was towards them. And look at how great they are at what they're doing. And I know from personal experience how much I trust them as well. So I want to, you know, say that message out loud as well. And eventually when retreats did start kept happening and did start becoming tangible, I noticed that a lot of people that came, they didn't come for them. They came for me. And it became very evident in that retreat setting, specifically one of the last ones that I held, that I ended up stepping into the role where I was holding almost the entire retreat with them doing some workshops here and there and leading some, some ceremonies. Um, and I've noticed when that retreat was taking place, because every time we are doing any sort of space holding for other people, anytime we're facilitating retreats or organizing them, we are getting so much back. And really guiding other people through whatever experience, it's actually going to trigger quite a lot of things in us as well. Either feelings of like, who am I to talk about that? Who am I to teach that? Or I'm not worthy. Or they are so far ahead of me. Th those were my thought processes quite often. And I realized that I've been holding myself back and putting myself behind the scenes quite a lot because I didn't feel worthy enough to be in the front of everything. And this is something that really in the last year I was having to step a lot into, realizing that I am actually the one that created this whole experience. I actually am the one who talk, took people on these journeys. In some cases, I was the one that ended up leading ceremonies. And that was like a huge shift for me, where it ended up, yeah, really stepping into that role that before I was rejecting quite a lot. Was there a moment in the last retreat where... A specific moment where you're like, this is the time where I'm going to step into my leadership, my masculine. And how did it feel in that moment? Actually, there was no one moment. It became very evident since the beginning. And then it was just re reaffirmed little by little by little. But you had to shed the old skin, the old layer to step yeah. into that, right? Yeah. And when I talk about creating containers for ourselves so we can go deep... When you really become a master at that, or good enough, let's say, processes of transformation become so rapid that this shedding of the old is kind of condensed and intensified, but it's shorter. So the process that other people would be going through for a year, for two years, when you have a strong container and you really guide yourself in there, that transformation is instant. And it's beautiful. The universe sets you up in that way mm -hmm. of like, you're going to be the leader in this situation and you're forced, not forced, but you're invited to step up in that moment. And mm -hmm. if you do, your life changes, your persona changes, you, you step into a greater version of yourself. Exactly. And in, in this, um, there's also something that comes up for me when you're saying this. There's two ways of doing this. One is the egoic way. Like I am because I am so great. I am this because I am that. Um, I know because I am who I am or because I know. And the other one is more transparent and vulnerable, which is, I feel like, what actual true leadership is, where you actually get to lead other leaders, where you get to teach other teachers, where you get to facilitate facilitators. Um, it's when you're coming with so much vulnerability and self-knowing, like inner knowing, that it doesn't matter how much you actually know or how much you can become this external authority. It's just how much open you are, how, how actually you can talk about what your own inner process is. Was there a leader that inspired you recently? 
Yeah, one of my mentors um, that I've been working quite quite close with, Garen Jones. Um, I've seen a lot of his work recently, and I've been facilitating quite a lot of his work as well. And he's a truly inspiration in person for me. The amounts of energies that he holds are are really incredible. And I have had a few other mentors, more in a business sense who are bridging the business and spirituality. You wouldn't probably know them because they're they're more behind the scenes in Berlin scene, in in US, in more of a startup scene. But yeah, their their leadership, I find it to be what what can really guide a lot of change when they actually like embody what they're teaching. And it's not some sort of a superficial thing where they basically put up a mask just so it creates more following but it's actually like the core embodiment of this strong leader. And I find each one of these mentors that I I talk about, they're all so different. And that is also the thing with stepping into my own leadership and also something for everyone that's listening to this, is that yes, these people are inspirational to us and they can be our mentors in the certain field. But it's also about recognizing that we all have our own individuality that is bringing something completely different. So if we're looking up to this one person, whoever this one person is, we're giving so much of our own power away. And it's the same if we, all we do is look for transcendental experiences in psychedelics, we're actually giving power away to psychedelics because we feel like we cannot go there on our own. Mm. And same with any sort of authority, not saying that any lineage is bad, but In a way, we are giving power away when we follow very strictly a certain teacher. So becoming a real leader and becoming your own inner guide is stepping into your own individuality and acknowledging that this person can teach me something, but I'm also much further along the way in so many other things. And I noticed that a lot of people whose podcasts I used to listen to, I find myself quite further down the line in spiritual evolution than they are. They're still talking about the same thing in the same way. Whereas I've listened to them, I've actually embodied a lot of what they said. I went out and had my own experiences and I find myself quite further down the line and I listen to their podcast now and I'm like, hmm, you're still talking about the same thing in the same way and I can actually add quite a lot of depth to that. Mm -hmm. We move in and out of frequencies, frequencies that used to be new Mm -hmm. and inspirational to us become familiar, and then we we keep expanding to the next level of awareness. Yeah, exactly. And I love what you said about not copying someone's leadership, that you are your your own unique Mm -hmm. uh, person with your own unique gifts, your own unique strengths, and that the leaders that you look up to did not get there by copying someone else. Like, uh, you know, Garen probably didn't say, oh, I'm going to become like this person. He was just fully himself. And the same is true for you and the same is true for for any other leader. So I think that's such an important thing to highlight of of not copying someone's blueprint. Yeah. Just learning, picking up things from their energy, Mm -hmm. but combining it with your experience, your wisdom, your life experience. Your own individuality. Yes. And that strips away the, the need for comparison as well. Because if we... If we see this person having something that we want, but it's not actually something that's right for us, it's also about creating our own discernment of what they are doing that we resonate with and what do we actually, out of that, want to embody. Mm. So for me, quite a lot of people that I have looked up to in certain fields, such as entrepreneurship and social impact, For me, for example, plant medicine has been such a big guide and for them it hasn't. So I see myself quite further down on this journey and I can get glimpses of these little bits and parts that I've learned from this journey and then bring it into whatever I'm learning from them in a way creating my own systems of change. Yes. I'm curious, was there any lesson or insight you picked up from Garen that that influenced you of how of how he is Mm, i think for from his specific work 
is a lot about transmuting trauma and moving it in space of artistry. I've learned quite a lot about that from him, as well as really letting the inner child come out. And I remember the the first time we spent time together, he, I ended up stepping in a bit of a role of facilitator, though my role in that specific retreat was quite different. Um, you just end up doing it, Jacob. It, it just ended up happening. <laughs> um, you cannot just be an observer. Exactly. When, when you know, when you see the invisible and you really see which gaps need to be filled, when one of the gaps is not filled, it almost becomes like this unbearable tension. Um, and that's how I ended up facilitating a lot of ceremonies as well when I used to live in the Amazon was because I would observe a person going through a strong process and maybe they didn't need hands-on anything. Maybe they just needed like specific energetical space held for them. And I've observed that nobody else was doing that. So it ended up being like this very natural stepping into facilitation um, role for me. And I remember that happened with Garen as well um, at one of his workshops at another person's retreat. And I remember after the workshop, we had a bit of a debrief and he looked at me and he said, those who know, know who knows. And he just left it at that. And that's one of the things that we still say um, to each other, to other people. Those who know, know who knows. Because you can really see, you can look at the person and you can know how deep they went. Mm -hmm. If they resonate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you can pick up on their energy. If you know, if you've done the work, if you've done the inner work, yes, then you know who else has done it as well. You can pick them from the crowd. You see as deeply as you have seen yourself mm -hmm. and no deeper. Exactly. And that's quite confronting to a lot of people as well. Because when, when you're used to a lot of work, you're used to a lot of depth and you try to meet people who are not used to that at your level, it might break their conditioning super quickly. And it might be incredibly triggering. And if they don't have tools to deal with that, yes, they will probably just reject you or like eliminate you from their life because they cannot handle that amount of energy. They cannot handle that amount of power. Yeah, I've had that happen to me recently where, and I realized why it happened is that I became so focused on, like for me in my life, it's important to seek the truth in everything. Mm -hmm. And these, um, this person was not on that path. They were happy to stay comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that was very confronting to them when I would, you know, seek the truth in our relationship and our friendship. And it, it just was not, it was not vibing for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wonder if you've ever experienced similar things with friends or, or, um, of course, especially yeah. old friends. Yeah. I, I've noticed it's increasingly hard for me to talk to anyone from, let's just call it back then. Back then. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's a book. There's the section back then. There's a back then chapter of Jacob for <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. And each step, each chapter that I made, I find people that were key actors in my life. They were there to really trigger a certain evolution yes. for me. Very important at the time. Very important at the time. Very profound allies or enemies or mentors. And over time, when my... And I'm not saying that this is one person evolving and the other person not. It's just saying that we're going in a very non-linear, different spiral. Um, so yeah, quite, quite a lot of time I had to pull myself away from people because there was just not enough depth and resonance for me to keep on the same path that I want to be going on and them just not meeting me there. And I've had that as well quite recently with somebody I had very close to me. Um, and I've just noticed that the way I'm being met there was just not the amount of energy I'm giving out as well. It was just not the same kind of interaction. Yes. And I was really seeking depth and I was seeking like this mutual support and that just wasn't coming back. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, that was quite an interesting experience for somebody who I really cherish and love so deeply. And just realizing that like, oh, we need to just maybe tone down the, you know, how much we talk and just not engage so much with each other. I love you, but also I'm on my own path and I'm going to keep going. Mm -hmm. It's really tough, especially when you were close with them before mm -hmm. and you can remember all the good memories and you go, what changed? And you don't want to judge them because it's not someone is more evolved or not. It's just that I don't even know sometimes what it is. It's just mm. the frequencies don't match anymore. Yeah. Water and oil, you know, and even if they used to, even if they used to. And, you know, like my recent situation, like someone blocked me out of their life and it made me feel like, was I the like the bad actor in this situation? Did I say something, you know, that was, you know, inappropriate? But yeah, it's a struggle sometimes. Yeah. The question is, does that matter? Mm. Maybe sometimes what we need to embody is a totally different persona as well. So we, for other people, play this key role in their life as well. Exactly. This is what a good friend of mine told me when I told her about this experience. She's like, yes, but you played a key role in his evolution. Mm -hmm. And if he was not able to handle that and needed to block you over something that was relatively minor, mm -hmm. doesn't that show you what his character is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talk to me about grief. Mm. Um, grief. So I think that that's a big one. It's something that is not really what we can put into a, one emotion. It's like a soup of many. Um, it's like an emotional ramen. <laughs> um, That'll be the title of this episode. <laughs> the emotional ramen. <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, I've experienced grief quite a lot in in my entire life, actually. Um, not from specific events or circumstances, but from kind of accumulation of a lot of things that made me feel melancholic in certain ways of, or having certain accumulative trauma. Um, and I think grief is something that happens every time we release anything. So whether or not that's taken away from us or we choose to let go of it. The loss of something. The loss of something. It's what the grief, in my opinion, is connected to. And then it becomes this soup of emotions and these waves that it, it just comes like a, in waves, like psychedelic journey. Um, and I think where there's a distinction between somebody processing it for a really long time versus somebody processing it more rapidly is the allowance of oneself to really feel all of it. And that is so overwhelming that quite often people tend to block it out. Um, so the grief of letting go of a house or something that is like our home base or grief of letting go of a partner. Um, That's a big one. Yeah, it's sometimes it needs to happen and we need to accept that that's, that's just the next step in evolution. That's the next step for us and that's the next step for them. I'm learning something, they're learning something as long as there's, you know, mutual understanding that this is what needed to happen because it's just the way things have played out then there doesn't have to be any harsh emotions around it, but yet the grief is still there. And the more we let ourselves actually go into the depth of it, like, wow, I had so many beautiful experiences in that place or with that person. And, and really honoring with so much gratitude, with so much reverence to what that specific circumstance or a person brought into our lives and really going into the gratitude around that. I think that's a massive part of the process because at the end of the day, what we are grieving is being the same as we were, is feeling those same emotions that we felt. So it's also important to realize that what we were, who we were, the way we felt is not limited to one person or one place or one circumstance. This is something that's within us. Mm. And I feel like coming out of grief is this realization. It's like, I am feeling all of it. 
I'm feeling so much gratitude for what we share and I'm feeling so much sadness that I won't feel that again with this specific person, but it's me actually. It's me who actually goes there and feels that and experiences that. And I can have that in another place or with another company or with another friend or with another another lover. It's it's all it's all us. And the depth of grief is is really depending on what these specific circumstances are, actually. Um, I think it can be very minor and a lot of people are going through a lot of minor grief all the time. They just push it away because it's uncomfortable. But even those minor little parts of grief, they need to be faced. And there needs to be some sort of going into whatever that means for us. Whether that's emotional release or trauma release or sacred rage, any sort of like alchemy, inner alchemy that needs to take place to transform that into really higher states of consciousness, higher vibrational emotions, let's say. Yes, I love what you said that what we're grieving is the person that we were. Can you expand a little more on that? Of course. Good job catching that one. I thought I hid it quite well in there. Um, It really hit me mm -hmm. because it, it shows me, oh, it's not about the other person or losing the other person, or losing the thing, the house, the lifestyle. It's losing who we were. Losing who we were, yeah. Let's take life as a hologram, whether or not it is, or if we subscribe to that belief. Um, it definitely if, is. <laughs> if, we are a, if we are the key player creating this hologram, then every other person around us is either a side actor just playing a role to make this seem real, or they are our allies, our enemies, our mentors. If we look at the hero's journey, what hero goes after he or she accepts the call to an adventure and crosses the threshold of the ordinary world to the extraordinary one. Hero meets allies and meets mentors and meets enemies. And each person that is within our life is not there to really attack us or whatever, but it is showing us parts of ourselves that we need to transmute and alchemize. So this entire hologram becomes a playground for us to be experiencing our divinity and our connection to God, whatever name we choose for the God as well, if any. Um, so when we go into deep partnerships, um, we we tend to have this person be the biggest catalyst for us unless we really refuse to do the inner work and reject all of this work that we're actually don't going rejecting all the depth which nobody that's listening to your podcast is going to fall into that category um yeah if we're really wanting to go there then our relationships become catalysts for further growth for further growth no matter what that looks like it might might look like intense arguments and drama or it might look like intense really supportive collaborations mm -hmm. whatever it looks like it's just catalyzing wherever we are and wherever we need to go and the way we feel with this person in a way it's also a part of this same hologram because these are our own feelings it's our own projection on the other person. And there's infinite holograms within a hologram, obviously, because you know as well that it's your reality and your world. So sometimes it's um, it's taking a little bit of um, more of a polarized approach when I say this or can be triggering to other people. But in reality is that nobody sees you the way you are. Everybody just projects on you. And we can play, as you said before, you can, we can play a villain in someone's story. And that's okay, because that's what they want to experience. And space holders, really deep space holders, shamans, they know that. There's a, there's a whole lineage of heyokas in, in Mexico, which are sacred clowns, with an intention to trigger your evolution through humor. Um, we can see that in different shamanic traditions in, in the Amazon as well, where they're taking more of a role of, of, the, of the sacred clown, of like really triggering you. 
So you go there. So you stop taking yourself too seriously. And that's what some people need. And if I just draw that back, um, every for every person in our lives, we're going to be playing an entirely different character. And every person in our life, we're looking at them through the lenses of everything that we've learned, who we are, and how we experience the world. Yes. So when we meet another person who we deeply connect with and we end up merging almost with them in so much of this catalyzation of like transmutation of this alchemy, of this beauty, we start getting very attached to how we feel around them, how, how we feel around them and what we perceive them to be in our life. And this creates this attachment to, I'm not actually attached to this person. I'm attached to the experiences that they bring to me, to how I feel around them. Or as we like to say, to how they make me feel, even though no other person can make you feel anything. How I feel around them. So, so when we go through a separation or a loss, we actually grieve all of those aspects. Right of how we were around that person, of how that person made us feel. Yes. Of the sound of their laugh, or maybe if it's a, if it's a close family member, um, if it's a, it's a loss through, through death or transcendence, it's, um, we're grieving like we grew up together. You know, we have these bonds, so we're grieving the bond. Because if we truly accept that this is not the ending, then we cannot grieve for another person because we know that they are just moving through the next stage of evolution, whatever that, that is. We cannot grieve for them. Mm, but we're, we're grieving, grieving our loss. We're grieving our loss. Of their no longer existing on this plane. Or in our lives. Or in our lives. In whichever way. Yeah. Yeah. Something you said was, you know, it. everyone who you're in a relationship with can be this huge catalyst for your growth, mm -hmm. whether it looks like chaos or collaboration. Mm -hmm. How do we know when the chaos is too much and as much as they are catalyst for our growth, it's better to go and seek that growth elsewhere and no longer accept that chaos? It's about personal discernment. It's about really, I feel like I'm really drawing this back over and over in every single conversation, it's, it's all about discernment. It's really checking in with ourselves and realizing that what are we attached to here? Are we attached to this intensity that comes with it? Both the shadow and the light, both the arguments and the beauty. Or are we attached to our personal evolution that's coming from that? Like, wh where is our actually grow actual growth happening? Yes. And if it's quite clear for us that this is no longer working and we realize that there is something else that feels much more resonant, then it's just about uh, discerning that and then making a choice. So I don't think there's an exact formula, again, of when that happens. And I think it's quite different for, for different people. But you said something really interesting. Are we attached to the evolution or are we attached to the, the highs and the lows, mm -hmm. the intensity of that person? I think that could be a really key determinator. And again, coming back to beliefs, mm -hmm. not sure if that is a limiting belief or not. But one of my beliefs used to be that the way I grow spiritually is through intense highs and intense lows. And you know that from my story. I I was suicidal at some point and those were my lows. I would go on a motorbike with an intention of like maybe not making it to the next destination. And um I see that by the way you drive in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that before. Um definitely not a pattern anymore. Um but yeah, Basically, I, I was really attached to, in a way, my growth and my evolution coming from strong lows. Because understanding alchemy is the deeper we go in the shadow and in the dark, the more evolution can happen. If we're always kind of stagnating at the very average, 
we're always going to stay stagnating at the very average because we don't have these strong jumping boards to go further. So I think that's also an important distinction that something I've been realizing for myself is I was never depressed or suicidal. I was actually really seeking growth in the depths of the darkest nights of the soul, ah. of really going so into and... In a way, I did allow myself to spiral quite deep in these patterns. Um, but actually realizing that that's where actual gold was, is where I was coming further out of it. And in the same way, it comes in the relationship as well. Because if we get attached to, to the growth that is coming from how we feel, mm -hmm. and not limited to the relationship. How we feel when we feel completely loved and completely surrendered, completely merged, versus on the other side, how we feel when we are throwing things at each other and screaming at each other. It's, it's this contrast that gets created. And jumping back and forth between it feels like creating a lot of opportunity for alchemy and for evolution. And that's why these things, either relationships or life in general, when we seek higher highs and deeper lows, mm. we are alchemizing, we are growing. So that's why I'm saying, I just don't know whether that is a limiting belief or not. I know in the stage where I'm in my life right now, I do not seek that anymore. So I do not seek to go you know, 200 kilometers per hour on a motorbike. I do not need skydiving. I do not need um, really these deep lows anymore. Maybe I will again. But for me right now, I'm not like seeking them. It, what are you seeking? What am I seeking? I'm seeking... Hmm, exploration of consciousness through mutual desire to grow. I feel like what my projects are moving towards right now is creating a strong dharma, creating a strong spiritual purpose, and then around that creating a sangha. So sangha in Buddhism means a collective of monks or nuns that are all working towards the same spiritual purpose. And if we strip away the lineages and the religion, what Sangha means to me is a bit more than a community, is a community that's dedicated to mutual growth. And everything that I'm building in my projects, everything that I'm under understanding from decentralization and really moving into this new paradigm of how society is going to function is based on Sangha, is based on our mutual desire for growth. And you're doing an incredible thing with bringing people together through podcasts, for sharing knowledge. It's a huge key for that as well. We're also bringing people in same spaces where they can actually do these things together, where it can be in person, one-on-one, -on -one, and creating online spaces where they can do that as well. That's what I'm trying to work towards. That's what my biggest dreams are. So this is also what I am seeking. And I'm learning that, that the more I have a strong community around me of people who uplift me and I uplift them and it becomes like this jumping frogs situation where yes, maybe you are in front of one person in this particular practice or particular thing, whatever it is, and maybe they're in the back so you can uplift them a little bit so that when they jump in front of you, they can bring you further as well. Yeah, And it's creating strong allies, strong partnerships, strong communities. Mm -hmm. mm, I love that. That's what my soul is really yearning for right now. Mm. You mentioned earlier conscious rage and sacred rage. And I'd love to dive into that and, and how you transmute rage, why we have rage in the first place. What is it? What does that symbolize for our being? Mm -hmm. What is it trying to communicate to us? And what do we do with it? In my opinion, the only difference between rage and sacred rage is the intent and the container. So when we experience something that's frustration or anger or any sort of 
this intense fiery dissonance we have an option to express it right away which can be quite harmful and we can see a lot of that in the world it keeps happening the truth is that a lot of us carry that and because of how harmful it is and seen as in society we tend to repress it so from my experience when i have experienced a lot of fire a lot of anger and this is something that's a very strong thing in my family line let's say it's this a lot of passion um which tends to take maybe a bit more of a shadow side sometimes i've noticed these patterns coming up for me quite a lot and because i wanted to be so different than my upbringing i tended to go to the complete opposite so i would go towards this feminine way towards just seeking peace and compassion and beauty and it had served me really well and i'm definitely a much better much calmer person because of that but i've noticed there was these li little glimpses of rage where the anger really wanted to find an expression and because of how i held myself to certain standards of being it never did so when i started realizing that this is just another energy that wants to flow and it's not inherently good or bad in any way that's a realization i had quite a while ago it became a way it it became something that just needed to be expressed and um we can see a lot of men movements these days going really deep into sacred rage into screaming into physical fights um physical confrontation i find a lot of value in that as well however however i don't think that's entirely necessary most of the time i think people go quite often um when they go through a process they tend to overdo it just a little bit like when somebody is really deep in the in their sadness and they're encouraged to cry or release through tears we can see sometimes that this inner child comes out that even when they have already processed mm. a certain emotion they still keep on crying mm. i had a really great teacher um a few years ago daniel prieto he works a lot with voice with some some really big names like mirabai seba um and i saw how he was holding space in his workshops and as soon as he felt that the person was done and he really worked with the feeling the energy the discernment the invisible not to say that he was the one that knew when the person was done but it actually was quite evident when person released what they needed to release he told them to stop it's like now it's time to stop crying and i feel that also is keeps happening in certain men movements let's say where this rage is encouraged to come out and i find that so beautiful and so valuable but at some point let's stop having rage come out because that's just going to create more rage um so i think creating really strong individualized containers where a person can express it without going over the top and where the container is safe and they're allowed to do that in whichever way that works for them mm -hmm. um and again i can't really give a formula for that because it's quite individual i do recommend seeking somebody who knows how to work with that in case that's something that wants to be explored for you personally can you talk about how you process anger how you process rage and what is a healthy way of expressing anger mhm mm i find any emotion to be the energy that moves within a body not maybe even necessarily limited to a physical body but i find emotion to be quite physical and tangible so whenever i'm feeling a trigger of any sort and let's not limit that one to rage because i feel like it's going to be quite a lot of value if i go more into the general um whenever there's a trigger that arises is really first of all being able to have enough of the ability of self inquiry to know that that is what is happening so not to project on another person that it's their fault for saying a certain way but really recognizing this is my own trigger 
whether it's something that's making us angry or making us sad or making us feel grief or making us feel nostalgic or whatever. Realizing that this is within us. Owning it. Owning it. And then noticing where it is and how it moves. Um, for me, I find, and that's just how my mind works, is everything is in colors, in elements, and in pictures. So for me, when I'm starting to feel a certain sense of rage, it's like this very red, fiery energy that wants to move mm, more in this way from the chest outwards or from a solar plexus outwards. Um, when it's sadness, I feel it coming more like a rain, more more like melancholic, deeper, dark blue colors. So for me, it's important to keep containers tight and not to actually deal with that when it's not the time for it to be expressed. Because as I said, in quite a lot of places where we're holding space as well, things get triggered within us. So if we immediately put ourselves first and be like, okay, this is my trigger. I need to process this now and go in this rage element or whatever, sadness, darkness. We actually cannot hold space for other people going through their own process. And I think life in all relationships is holding space for each other, holding containers for each other. So when we are, we are in a certain situation and these things come up, maybe it's not the time for them to be expressed or processed. Mm. So we can just keep this awareness going in our body and really focus on where it is, how it's moving, really kind of familiarize ourselves with, ourselves with it. And then whenever there is a time, we create a special container for that to be released. And whatever that means for us, it might be creating a ritual, it might be creating a ceremony, it might maybe going into plant medicine journeys or working with our voice. Um, what has been really powerful for me was finding spots in nature specifically waterfalls, which are so loud that nobody can scream stronger than the waterfall can. So I have always, almost every place I go to, I have my specific locations that are pretty much soundproof. And then I scream until my voice goes out. And I find that to be so much moving of the energy. And um, quite a lot of times I notice that it's the end of the scream. It's just the end of rage. There's no rage anymore. There's no anger anymore. So what happens is I start observing how this energy is moving now. And quite often it comes out through song or it comes through movement. Somatically, I can feel where it's moving and I can allow it to move. And then quite often it comes out as a song. Where do you think anger and rage comes from? Why are they triggered in us? Because it can be like zero to a hundred in certain situations. That's a good question. I, I have no idea. I don't know specifically where it comes from. I think it's probably from things that are pushed away. It's not dealing with the shadow. Or it could be something that is just the energy we need to experience in the moment. Like especially with when rage is directed at someone else. Mm -hmm. What I've heard and makes sense to me is that some boundary has been crossed. Right. And so we've maybe feel angry, not even at the other person, but at ourselves for allowing that boundary to be crossed. Do you relate to that at all? I can see how that makes sense. Yeah. Boundaries are so important. It's also a part of creating containers. Do you think the rage is always about something that we're projecting and not actually about the thing or the situation or the other person? Or is it a co-creation? It's a co-creation, for sure, but co-creation with whom and why? Mm -hmm. So, again, if this is a hologram and if we're just experiencing ourselves, yeah. yes, the other person is triggering us, but isn't it really just us triggering ourselves? Mm. Maybe that's something that we need to experience in a specific moment is rage. Mm -hmm. or betrayal or crossing of boundaries. Yes. And we've called this person, this opportunity in to give us the gift of experiencing that. Maybe just because we need to switch our energy a little bit or maybe because we need to learn how to alchemize it into something else. 
And quite often I find intense emotions in any way triggered by other people as them giving us gifts. Mm. Gift of this intensity that I can work with now. Because if I stay on that same average all of the time, I don't have these things to work with. Yes. So I honor people that trigger me. I love them. I, I appreciate them. I call them in. I keep them close, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, babe, I need a trigger today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about love and relationships. Mm. I thought that's what we talked about for the last half an hour. <laughs> it is actually what we're always talking about. It. <laughs> I want to ask you a personal question. How many times have you been in love? Mm. Do you mind if I get a bit philosophical about this? Yes. And I'm not entirely avoiding the question, just so you know. You take it as you want it. I have been learning to fall in love deeper with myself and that has allowed me to fall deeper in love with others and quicker and i think the more i have experienced really being able to cultivate that falling in love not just love but falling in love with myself the more i'm open able to really quickly open my heart to other people so i don't know the number that's not how my brain works but throughout my exploration of my my consciousness and my experience and also the joy of experiencing all these intense emotions we talked a lot about grief and about shadow and the polar opposite of that is love so the being human, being fully embodied, integrated human means allowing yourself to feel the full spectrum, in my opinion. So for me, that has been really leaning into allowing myself to feel all of the darkness, all of the density, all of the shadow, but also to feel all of the light and love. And for me, that means walking around me with my heart fully open. And really allowing other people to see that, to feel that. Mm. Of course, I have my own boundaries and I have my own containers. But falling in love is easy for me. Then actually building up on top, that's, that's where a challenge comes in. Because that's where we're actually needing to step into work, we, into co-creation. It's not just the surrender and the openness. But it's actually like... Here, where is it where we want to go? And are we willing to compromise our ways potentially a bit to walk that path together? That's fascinating. Talk to me more about that. About the co-creation. The co-creation, yeah. Like, okay, so you're already in love. That's the easy part is how, how you put it. For, for me, for you're you, asking yes. very specific questions about me, very personal. I find for this quite is, a lot of people... This is the Jacob Grichard episode. <laughs> I find for quite a lot of people falling in love and really opening up is quite a longer process. Mm. Um, yes. So so that's, that's very individual. Uh, for me, just opening myself up to another their person is quite easy. And then the, the co-creation for me means realizing what our values are and then aligning them, see where they're aligned actually, not, not changing our ethos and our values, but really finding where the points, meeting points are and then deciding what we want to co-create together and where we want to go and what we want to experience. And then actually also holding each other accountable of going there. Yes. I would never want a relationship where everything is sugar-coated all the time. You want someone to be real. I want somebody to be real. To actually tell me when am I slacking? When am I not pulling my weight? When am I not doing the work? When am I not fully embodying my masculine? Yes. Um, so yeah, th this becomes a co-creation. So life becomes a co-creation it becomes a play and then suddenly we're not just exploring this hologram on our own but we start playing with another person 
what is the hardest part of the work in a relationship? Transparency in our own process for me. So my mind tends to go quite a lot of steps ahead because the dots just connect differently. And then for me realizing that in order for me to explain what is actually happening, I need to dissect the process and talk about different smaller parts of it is something that I'm learning to be able to communicate. So I think one of the key works is communication, transparency, vulnerability. Mm. Um, and in communication as well, understanding that we have different styles and then adjusting to meet the needs of the other person. Mm -hmm. Because you can align on so many things, on literally everything, and that person can be perfect. But if the communication is so drastically different, then it comes down to either you learn how to talk each other's love language or you don't. And then you grow into different different ways, different directions. Yes. How can we learn to communicate better as partners, as friends, in any relationship? First important part is self-inquiry, is understanding of where we are. And then it's the vulnerability to share that with the other person and actually openly communicating our boundaries and our needs. And when we do that, it gives the permission for the other person to do the same. And when do they do the same, we can find meeting points. It's not that hard. It's like creating a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. This is me, this is the other person. And where we meet is where we want to be living for most of our communication. Tell me about your journey with vulnerability. And how has that been over the years? Have you become more vulnerable, less vulnerable? What has the process been like for you? Vulnerability has been one of my key, key skills since I was a teenager. I had not a lot of challenges expressing where I'm at and maybe in communicating it because I don't come from an environment where communication is something that's worked on. It's just the way it is and we don't talk about things and we suppress them. And so communicating about where I'm at was definitely a challenge, but for me to actually openly show up and be vulnerable in a moment was not that big of a challenge for me. So my journey with vulnerability has been stepping more into the understanding of where I'm at and then learning to communicate that. Hmm. Being in your own truth and then communicating it to the other person. Exactly. It can be really tough to communicate someone your truth to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure for, for some listeners, they can relate. Is there any advice or guidance that you can provide on how to communicate our truth better? Unapologetically, without the fear of the other person reacting in a certain way because it's our truth. So the more we can actually express what it is and normalize the shadow parts of it too, the more we normalize talking about our shadow, the more vulnerable we become, the more we're creating this culture of actually going there and actually creating depth as opposed to just superficiality. Because the superficiality is a part of our truth, but it's not all of our truth. So if we really want to talk about all of it, it needs to come from a place of, I don't know how this other person is going to react and that's okay. Really accepting ourselves first in this truth. And then the more the other person can hold a safe container for that to be expressed, mm -hmm. the the more we allow ourselves to actually go there. So the key seems to be that there, there has to be a safe container. There has to be a safe container. Otherwise, and you know, we've probably all picked this up in childhood and teenage years, when there is no safe container, you actually retreat 
-hmm. you go further into yourself and you say never again not sharing my truth yeah yeah and full self-acceptance without judgment is in itself us creating a safe container for ourselves this notion of not really needing the other person to react a certain way is creating space for ourselves so yes if the other person is willing to step into holding that space for us incredible but if they're not we need to do it by ourselves and this is this unapologetic expression of this is who i am and all i am and here it is in the last year have you become more unapologetically real i feel like i have yeah in which ways did that show up for you in the ways that i have started recognizing things that we talked about in the beginning more of what my limiting beliefs are around different things and then realizing that actually other people are seeing me in a very different way how were they seeing you whenever i play small there is my sangha my community of people who actually call me out on that mm. who tell me this is not who you are and you are playing small now and so valuable so valuable yeah and it's really important to surround ourselves with people who are on this path and really really understand that as well so for me that has been something that i have started unapologetically stepping into is actually i am doing this and actually i am playing small and actually i am being triggered and acting on my trigger and actually thank you for calling me out on my ego instead of me being oh holding on to the truth of i know but yes this was a mistake and i am sorry yes i did do that and there was not in highest alignment and then stepping unapologetically into what is my highest alignment actually what where do i want to go who do i want to be what energies do i want to embody and then stepping into that and i feel this feels like stepping into my truth more and more because i know that the limiting beliefs i know that the projections they're not my truth they were just there as temporary structures to make me feel safe when i needed to be held and when there's no more need for that we can really go further in our in our growth in our evolution what is the highest truest expression of your vision for yourself and your life i feel that when i am the most in service is when i feel the most complete and for me right now the role of being in service is taking shape in creating sangha and in holding transformational containers as well as bridging the gap for from these transformational containers to where people can actually take the learnings into their lives and when i am in the role of letting people step into this knowledge and really embody it and when i see them grow for me that is such a wholesome experience yeah yeah it's beautiful hmm what is the biggest lesson you learned about love in the last year that love never goes away that when we are deeply loving or in love or holding space of love for to with someone else it's it's a powerful bond and even if there is a separation that happens even if there is a container held in a certain way and it ends up changing or just changing shape the way we relate to each other the love doesn't go away that is so tough because it's what it comes back to the grief and the loss because when we lose a friend or a partner but we still feel love for them Mm-hmm. even though they've exited our life or we've exited their life um 
how do you reconcile that? That there's a part of you that still deeply loves them and yet it's so not a match anymore. And it's also mixed in with maybe some resentment or some pain or some hurt. It comes back to reverence, about back to gratitude for experiencing what we have and non-attachment to things being a certain way. Right. So instead of attaching to how we perceived that thing to work out, letting go of that attachment and then stepping into the fact that love is always there because that's what we are. And then letting go of the attachment to things looking the certain way or to have a certain structure. And we can still love a person and realize that we just cannot work together in the way that makes sense. And that that does create a certain boundary that we can then hold. And within that experience a different form of love that might be more aligned or might be more pure, might be just different. Who knows? But it's exactly what our next stage of evolution is, exactly what we need to experience. Someone once told me that, how do you know that what you're experiencing right now is right for you? And the answer is because you're experiencing it right now. Everything that you're experiencing right now is exactly the way it should be because it is what's happening. If you were somewhere else in your personal journey or evolution or your hero's journey, you might be experiencing something else. But because of where you're at, your own level of growth, the lessons that you're getting are exactly what you need to be getting. And this comes back to ownership of our own reality. Because if we keep blaming other people or comparing ourselves, we, we step back from taking responsibility. And wherever I'm at right now is exactly where I need to be. Whatever I'm going through is exactly what I need to be going through. And if we can look at ourselves and do a little bit of shadow work and realize that, oh, maybe I hold some patterns that are potentially unhealthy, so to speak, or I hold some patterns that were not the right match, then we can actually realize that this is a potential for growth. This is also a catalyst for growth. And the love doesn't go away, but it just takes different shape based on where we are and how we are able to receive it. Earlier you said that you fall in love with others easily the deeper you fall in love with yourself. And I wonder if you can talk to me more about your journey with self-love and how you've fallen deeper in love with yourself. My journey with self-love has been quite challenging because of my story of really rejecting myself as a teenager in so many ways. Having an autoimmune disease and having to heal that through my own spiritual journey. I think plant medicine, especially ayahuasca, has been a major key player for me to really start learning to love myself again. Um, and I used to have a blog called Unconditioned Curiosity. And I feel like in that blog, I've kind of touched on the basis of really letting the inner child out when we play. And the way I have lived my life at the time was through just constant play, using this hologram, these experiences in the real world to actually see how much I can alchemize, how much I can create, how much I can manifest, how much I can just play around. And that led me through long journey of traveling, of these crazy experiences that I've had. And this, this play of the inner child was where I felt so happy, where I felt so safe, where I felt so at home. And then putting plant medicine in the mix, she was showing me that all these places of playfulness and love and inner children, um, I've been creating more of that because I haven't had enough of that as I was growing up. 
So having this realization, it brought me to the understanding that in order for this child to really relearn how to have this experience of love is by holding a container for myself in this case. So to step into my divine masculine and my, into my divine feminine, both as a mother and as a father, and actually hold myself as a child. And the journey of self-love in these in these containers was recognizing that a lot of things were my choice. A lot of the things that have manifested in my hologram, in my experience, were something my soul has chosen to do and not something I should be blaming myself or others for. But it's uh, their gifts for myself so I can further my evolution. And I started cultivating a bit of deeper love for myself because of that. For my inner child to be able to play, for my inner parents to be able to hold space for that, for my inner feminine to be able to play and be in flow and be inspired and follow this inspiration and intuition, for my inner masculine to hold safe containers for myself. And the more I delved into archetypes, that I was playing out, the more appreciation grew inside of me for each one of these archetypes. And it's been quite a journey to really celebrate myself. But I feel like honoring and celebrating oneself is probably where a lot of self-love can actually take place and a lot of healing can occur. Because quite often we're actually also so drawn to just move, move, move and keep going, going further. But we don't actually step back and look back at our lives and go like, wow. First of all, I pulled myself out of that, like, wow. And then secondly, of like, wow, I'm proud of myself for doing this. Like, I love myself. And maybe the journey of self-love for some people, it's not just about playing with the archetypes and really honoring them and appreciating them. Maybe for some people might be a bit more tangible where they actually need to commit to saying it to themselves every day maybe looking at themselves in the mirror mm -hmm. and repeating to themselves i love myself maybe that's what it takes but i think really falling in love with yourself on this deep level is what needs to happen for you to be able to accept love from others as well because we can only accept the depth we can only meet others at the depth that we meet ourselves. We can only take others as deeply as we have gone ourselves as well. And that keeps manifesting itself in different ways through self-love, through creating transformational experiences. We cannot really take people through intense healing of a deep trauma if we haven't done that by ourselves. We don't know how to relate to them. We don't know how to talk to them. In the same way, we cannot love someone deeply and truly passionately, openly, vulnerably, transparently, if we don't do that with ourselves first. And that is a journey, and that does take time, um, for most of us, at least. Not too long ago, you had your birthday. How was that specific birthday for you? Did it feel like you you got to celebrate where you are in life? And how, how was that for you? I actually don't normally celebrate birthdays. Um, but I do celebrate myself quite often in different occasions. So, yeah, I do have a lot of opportunity to really, really celebrate myself. On my birthday, I just sent my mom a message saying like, hey, thank you. Good job. You know, <laughs> this is a day to celebrate you and your hard work, not me. I didn't do so much, you know. <laughs> why, why don't you celebrate your birthdays? Um, there's quite a few reasons around that. Um, mainly it's just not really wanting to step into following a very specific way the society is being made to track time. Um, I find time to be a very different concept. And although I have my Google calendar with all my meetings on there, um, I find that when we create strong containers, we can actually collapse time. We can create a year long journey within a small period of time, within a small retreat, within a small online course. We can actually realize that 
in a year we can grow more than other people grow in a lifetime. So I feel like celebrating ourselves periodically, especially based on a very masculine patriarchal sun calendar, um, instead of actually following the natural cycles of the moon, for example, or like cycles in our body or cycles in our evolution. And it comes back to also realizing what our own evolution is. What are the cycles that we're moving through? I know for me, it's three, two and a half year cycles or three year cycles. Um, I noticed when I left Slovenia, it was two and a half, almost three years uh, of me like traveling through Europe and going through something. And then it was like another period of something else. And then there was a period where I lived in the Amazon and delved deep in the plant medicine journey. There was another period of me settling down and feeling like I have a home for a while. And now I'm noticing as well, I'm celebrating another period where I'm actually stepping into a lot of my own power of being able to share this with other people. It's like the hero's journey where the hero returns home. It's a cyclical manner. And I find the sun calendar as well to be quite limiting in that way. I find watches and clocks to be quite limiting in a way because we might have an hour of space to do a breathwork journey. How deeply can I take you in an hour? I wanna take you through a whole process where you revisit your childhood, where you revisit your traumas, where you pull out all the weeds, where you actually have this insane transformational experience that's not, that does not feel like an hour. Mm -hmm. When we have a plant medicine journey, how many times have you felt as well that you've relived multiple lifetimes, not just one? Went yes. back through your past lives and then into your future ones, finding this super conscious interconnected mind where the time just did not exist. You literally feel yourself moving through timelines on a mushroom trip. Yeah. And then you come back and you realize, oh, that was like four hours. And I it's know. still going. <laughs> hmm. I do. Yeah. I, I look at my clock and I'm like, there's no way it's only been three hours. <laughs> like, it's crazy. Yeah. I've had a journey like this not so long ago where it felt like an infinity. And at some point I looked at the time and it was only three and a half hours or four hours. And I was actually <laughs> wanting it to stop. It was way too long. Um, but it just kept on going and going. It just found more and more depth. So long answer to your question, but I feel like the time is quite limited construct and I really don't seek to celebrate my birthday. I do really acknowledge when other people put some sort of attention and effort to making it special. And that's what really makes it special for me is just knowing that other people care and it brings this little bit of joy and celebration. But I don't think it should be limited to doing it every year. Yes. And it's interesting, like two things really resonated. One is that the two and a half year cycles that were like two years and you, I totally noticed that as well. I don't know, I have to think about what it is for me, but just like you brought awareness to me of like, ooh, what is my cycle? Is it two years? Is it three years? Is it two and a half? And uh, thank you for that reflection. Because mm -hmm. I think we tend to think like, ooh, new year, new me, and we're trying to fit our growth into this one year calendar. Mm -hmm. But when I think of my life, it usually does take at least two years, two and a half to really go through an arc and, mm -hmm. and start something new, learn something, come out of it on the other side, and then start the next cycle. Yeah. So that that's such a beautiful uh, insight. And then the second thing was with the birthdays, I actually completely relate in the sense like I don't need to celebrate my birthday. And I, I would rather just keep living life exactly how it's going mm -hmm. and finding those touchstones and moments of evolution which do not come on a specific predestined calendar day they come exactly. at their own time right like my ayahuasca journey my first one specific mushroom trips specific people i met mm -hmm. specific podcasts i did it's like those don't just land on a birthday <laughs> they land when they land yeah uh, but i do find it tricky because inevitably on that day people who know you and who know your birthday will reach out which is beautiful of them but it's that reminder that even when you don't subscribe to that calendar, other people will kind of subscribe you <laughs> to that calendar. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, if uh, you feel the same way sometimes and how you na navigate that. I think a lot of people subscribe to a lot of things I don't entirely resonate with or agree with. 
and I am okay with that. I think finding a strong flow with our beliefs, integrating them into what other people believe is a very useful skill. And that's as well something I'm talking about when I say integrating the psychedelic journeys. For example, our platform connecting members to psychedelic coaches and therapists is about bringing these transformational journeys and then like weaving them into the everyday life. And what does that actually mean? That means that you are able to go into, for example, the current economic system, even if you don't entirely resonate with it. Um, we see that quite a lot when people take a lot of plant medicine is they get quite ungrounded and what they do for work doesn't fulfill them anymore because of these new realizations that they've had. So they struggle going back to doing what they do but they don't have anything else that they want to be doing or that they're good at or where their genius meets their 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 skill sets or um, rather their, their wishes and their wants. Um, so I think it's important to some degree to subscribe to whatever the collective is wanting to do and then find little ways to actually break them in our own magic. So we're doing that with decentralization now, with, with AI, with all these tools that are breaking the constructs of what we, what we think we know in our society um, and the whole movement with Web3 as well. Um, but when it comes to time, for example, other people subscribe to certain calendar and we can notice other people subscribe to the other. So maybe we can adopt a little bit of what feels like really resonant for us and then whenever other people are in their own belief system, we can just let them be there, but maybe just, you know, encourage them to be a bit open about other things as well. For example, what really resonated for me was tracking moons in the Mayan calendar. Um, for wh what really resonated for me as far as readings go is Vedic um, astrology more than the Western one. So I find that to be much deeper when it's following natural cycles, not the man-made cycles. And... Um, yeah, within that, every time somebody wishes me a birthday, I just say thank you because I am really appreciative. And at the same time, I do remind them that the calendar's wrong. And, you know, maybe just forget whatever you were taught <laughs> <laughs> and like allow yourself to experience this like not knowing as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's a good balance, you know. It's a good balance. Do you think that's also the resistance of the five year plan for some people that they mm -hmm. feel? the pressure of that calendar to achieve certain milestones in that five years? Yeah, it's definitely a pressure. It's definitely also stepping up to, to, to a certain amounts of growth in a very structured linear time. And I think that was also one of the biggest resistances for me was the way that the time is structured in that. Um, but then it's also about like accepting that things will happen. And it's, like I said, breaking the structure when that happens. It's about realizing that the growth is not linear, that it's more like a spiral, that it's more like ups and downs. And then allowing the structure to break, break when it does. How do you see time these days, like in terms of your weeks and your months? How do you conceptualize them? Is there a specific way that you live a week or that you live a day? that that flows for you i'm working towards having a strong self-care planner and personal boundaries which make me step away from doing all the work with other people at least one day per week which doesn't really matter what day that is um, i find actually to work on my own thing sunday to be the easiest one um, and then the rest of the time i do have to adjust to again being completely integrated, I do need to adjust to other people's calendars and time zones. So a lot of my calls happen early in the morning or late in the evening. So I do adjust to that quite a lot. Um, but I do have my own self-care practices that do fall somewhere in between that. So I do give myself time. Maybe it's not first thing in the morning because that's not with the time zone we're in now, but maybe it's the second thing in the morning where I actually take my time to take care of myself. 
and um, allowing more of this kind of culture of self-care, I feel like it's more important than tracking it in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about manifestation and experiencing instant manifestation through surrender. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, been, it's been quite a journey to let go of the charge that this world has around it because I feel like it's quite thrown around these days. Everything becomes about manifestation. Um, there is there is a beauty that happens when we start to allow ourselves to really take the role of creators. But that doesn't mean from an I am God, egoic perspective. It's more with I am a part of the divine and the divine is flowing through me. So what I've been experiencing recently is that whenever I think of something that I really, really want, if it's coming from a very pure place of channel, it ends up happening within a day or sometimes even hours. And it has, it has started coming through as, for example, I decided I want to birth this project in a different way. And within a day, I had a whole team and I channeled the entire vision for them. Wow. So this was a manifestation. And now in the physical realm, it's still taking shape slowly because that's just how the nature of our reality works. Um, but it's just how instantly it actually happened was incredible. And I had another thought where I really wanted to feel supported in working for for somebody who's like really aligned for, for a company that's creating a lot of what I'm creating as well. And I remember having a thought of, I've, I've been creating so much. I've been stepping into the role of, you know, a CEO and like a leader and a facilitator and so much. I would love to just work for somebody right now who is aligned, who can provide me a little bit of structure for me to step into. And within a day, I met a person who pretty much hired me on the spot. So that was another one of those. And then I started asking myself, how, how does this even happen? Like, what's the, what's the actual process around that? And I think that when we let go of structures, and I know I'm kind of contradicting myself here, building the structures and then breaking them. Um, but when we, when we let go of how we think that things should be, and allow things to happen the way they need to happen and still having this structure of our own development and us stepping up to whatever we need to be and we want to be and then allowing the universe to just play itself out it's always going to play itself out in a better way and it's always going to play out itself out in a faster way because we need to look at what it is that we want behind what we think we want Mm. So instead of being, I want a house, we can think of what does this house give me? What, what do I actually get from it? Like, do I, do I get to feel at home? Is that what I'm looking for? Do I get to feel safe? Do I just want a roof over my head to not get rained on? What is it that I actually want? Do I want a relationship? Does the house represent for me a relationship? Because... That's where, you know, I can be with another person and I couldn't be with another person without a house. So when we start asking ourselves, what is a deeper question be behind that? And then setting that intention in the universe and really pushing that out. It's normally when it really comes through so rapidly that actually that thing happens and it's normally much better. Yes. Than what we would have won. You're looking for the, 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 the meaning behind the symbol. So the yeah. house is the symbol. What does it mean to you personally, to your soul? Exactly. And then allowing it to play itself out in any way that it wants to be played. Uh -huh. With an intention of this is what I want or better. That's the surrender piece. That's the surrender piece is where we actually let go of needing it, let go of the, the attachment to it. And then just allowing it to happen. Mm. Yeah. And you mentioned when you're a pure channel, that's when it comes instantly. 
how can we be a pure channel to our intentions? Very individual, and there are so many different ways. Acknowledging where things are stuck and then unblocking them, it's probably the biggest thing. If we choose to follow lineages or traditions, we may notice that, for example, in Chinese medicine, there's meridians. In Ayurvedic, in Vedic, in yoga, there's nadis, which are these energetic channels that are going through the body. And quite a lot of ancient traditions, also from Egypt and from the Amazon and from the Andes, have similar ways of looking at the body as a system. So the more physical body is stuck, it's actually holding back the flow of the energy as well. Um, that can manifest itself in different way. In yogic tradition, which is the one I've been following for the longest, so that's the one I can speak to the most, um, the yoga practice starts with asana as the third part. And then it moves into pranayama. Asana practice is the physical practice. So what we see as the Western yoga is basically just asana, just one of the eight parts of yoga. And then the, sec the next one is pranayama, which is breath. So once our body is healthy, once our body is agile, and specifically working with the spine, with that central channel, then we can work with breath. We can start moving and circulating this energy. And they associated the breath with the energy flow and different types of breath work. There's hundreds and hundreds of different types of pranayama. Um, we can also see more of like Western traditions that are a bit more cathartic and really masculine and mm, let's go for it. Um, and then it's different types of directing the mind and concentration, um, dhyana. And um, yeah, with that, we are going even more of a subtle than the breath, which is when we're realizing that everything in our body is constantly mo moving and we become aware of the emotional body, the etheric body, all the subtle bodies that are less gross. So there's different practices from yogic tradition. It comes through practicing asana first and then pranayama and so on. In different traditions, it might be more in kundalini, let's say. Um, it's just about doing different kriyas, which are different purification exercises. Then we can look on the Andean, Amazonian um, traditions, more from like places where people work with plant medicine. That is the clearing of the channel as well, is when we're calling in the energy of a specific plant, when we sing Icarus to it, um, that plant spirit comes through us and helps us clear whatever needs clearing. In Chinese medicine, it's identifying the source of the disease, going five steps back from where it's actually manifesting in the physical body. So those are the places where the energy is already stuck. So identifying with personal discernment of what is right for us. Um, so again, maybe in yoga, we're following someone else's asana, someone else's practice. Um, and there's different traditions that we could follow as far as that goes, like developing our own kriyas that manifest themselves through shakti path, through the um, channeling of, of the shakti energy. Um, but I feel like what it comes down to is really being discerning personally of what is happening in our body, self-reflection, um, self-inquiry, scanning our bodies, really noticing where the energy is being stuck, and then finding tools and that's where mentors and teachers and allies are good because they can give us all the tools. And now with internet and with Web3, we have so much availability for so many different tools. We can take literally all the tools and just like see whatever works for us. And then actually sticking to whatever works for us and developing our own practice around that, discerning what is true for us. That's when we actually start like purifying that, when we start clearing that. And now for me... I've gone through so many different lineages and so many different chapters in my life where I was obsessing with breathwork, doing holotropic breathwork every single morning, which I don't recommend doing at home, but also if it calls to you, please do. Um, same with plant medicine. It's been such a huge part of my life. So I would, when I lived in the Amazon, drink ayahuasca every other day. And that really helped me to dive into the understanding of different channels in my body and different systems. So 
It's an individual journey. I would say take all the tools that you can find and see what works for you. And then once you hone it down, just keep doing it. For you in the last year, was there a specific tool that helped you unblock energy? Yes. Um, sound. Sound. So I kept a set of singing bowls from Crystal Tones, Crystal Bowls, um, that I was guarding for a while for someone else. And the way I had led my own ceremonies was I created a safe container for us, myself and I went into a psilocybin journey with the use of sound, didgeridoos, my voice and, um, and tobacco and having the container that was held for sound and then for sound, observing how things are moving with my in my body and toning to different parts of my body that needed attention while somatically experiencing where the energy was stuck and allowing it to move. Mm. Why don't you recommend holotropic breath work every morning? <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like some things need a practitioner to be there. I see. Have you had some dicey experiences? I'm, I'm quite trauma informed. So I think when it comes to understanding each individual is just about sensitivity to what might be triggered in that journey. So I think for most people who can hold space for themselves, doing something like holotropic breath work every morning is quite beneficial. But if you don't have the groundwork of these basis of understanding yourself deeply, when you really push to like extremes, it's like going for an ayahuasca ceremony without any space holders straight off the bat. So it can be just as intense. It can be just as profound. Um, but I feel like there needs to be some smaller steps and build up and like a lot of inner knowing. Yes. I've only done breath work a couple times and for me it's been just incredible mm -hmm. so i don't know uh, the the journeys i've experienced were almost like a mini dmt journey mm -hmm. um and you go so deep it's it's amazing but every morning i don't know how that how that would feel you actually how long did that go for for you 90 days 90 days mm -hmm. and who were you at the end of 90 days i was definitely a much different version of me yeah um, it's there's something to be said about the accountability um, and about habits and the discipline that gets created. There's definitely a dance with resistance that happens in that space. Um, this has been something that I've been really called to share with other people more and more is creating spaces of spiritual sovereignty where people can actually develop more their inner knowing and allow themselves to be their own guides instead of relying on teachers and gurus and authorities to tell them what to do, but develop their own practice of dancing with resistance, of going step by step and building up on top of it. Um, so as, as much as I recommend doing everything by yourself, I also know that there needs to be a certain way of building up to it. Um, and for some people it doesn't, for example, for me, that was not the case. For me, I went straight from doing breath work a few times to doing it every single day for myself, by myself. What inspired that? The first few times were so meaningful to you that it inspired 90 days of, of that? Well, actually I was doing Wim Hof method for a few years in a row every single morning and that was my really strong masculine disciplinary practice and then when i moved more towards the feminine way more towards tantric way and plant medicine i ended up releasing all the asana practice all the strict yogic um, textures and more um like less of a wim hof and um and then when i rediscovered breath work again it was actually just this one moment where my best friends my facilitators at the time were leading a breathwork journey and people were going so deep and it was so profound and it was catharsis and crying and screaming and we looked at each other and our immediate thoughts on both sides was like oh what would happen if we did that every morning 
this is just so intense and so ridiculous and we love intensity and we love pushing our limits and our boundaries so for us it was just kind of like taking on this challenge with curiosity of oh what is going to happen here just just curious you know what was the most interesting thing that happened for you in those 90 days there's quite a lot of mm, Let me try not to be too woo-woo around that. Um, there's quite a lot of perceptions and abilities that do open up when you go this deep every day. Um, it's something that I've observed already when I was really deep in plant medicine journeys. Um, and yeah, for me, it was just this transformation of like rewiring of my neural network in a way that I was able to perceive things in a different way that I wasn't able to before, where my mind was making different kinds of connections and seeing different kinds of things. So that's something that, yeah, was definitely a byproduct of doing a lot of breath. And then secondly, it was like my body started transforming as well. The way I could keep large amounts of energy the way I could like actually hold this intensity in my body, nothing seemed extreme anymore. Wow. So these intense emotions that I was experiencing from triggers, from things that were happening around me at the time, just didn't, didn't seem so major anymore. Even though from the outside, a lot of people were like observing things happening and just wondering like, wow, how are you so chill about it? It's because I did breath work every morning. Would you say your psychic abilities were enhanced during that time? I love how you just honed that down from what I was avoiding. Yes, <laughs> I would say that. Why Why avoiding? This is mm. so fascinating to me. Because it has a lot of... Um, it, it has quite a lot of energy attached to it when we talk about that. Um, it, it has a lot of what I observe is um ego ego attachment to it like spiritual ego so i see quite a lot of people in this new age growing community which do have some skills that have developed at some point over time and then they start highlighting them quite a lot and becomes more of like an identification and like this spiritual ego of I am this and I have these abilities and I have these skills. So for me, it's not something I really want to openly talk about um, or it is just something that I really believe is something when the collective is really on the same wavelength of where we are able to go as humans and what we are able to see and what we are able to perceive, it's going to normalize itself and become a part of the conversation. But to actually put it out in like a larger audience, um, I feel like there is still a little bit of a gap that might take a little bit more time to be, to be bridged. I have found through my mushroom experiences that I've gotten more intuition, mm -hmm. more perception, I can, I'm very sensitive to energy now mm -hmm. in a way that is very helpful. It's like, I can just know certain things and I love that about you. Yeah. yeah your intuition is super on point. Yeah. It's hard to hide things from me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's also hard for me to hide things from others who are mm -hmm. on the same path because it's like, we can just read each other's energy so well. Yeah. And um, the veil just becomes so thin, so thin. And then like I get insights into my future timelines like very clearly. It's like, oh yeah, this thing is very likely to happen if if I do my work and my part of the the deal with mm -hmm. the universe, you know, then these things will will align. And it's um that's just fascinating. Just kind of knowing your future in a way. Mm -hmm. So you think you have a deal with the universe? <laughs> Not not in a dark, scary way. <laughs> what What is your deal with the universe? I'm curious. I think what I mean by that is that, so I see certain futures for myself, but in order for that to be a reality, I have to do the work. Right. Right. So that is that is the implicit deal of like, we will support you. I'm talking like from the universe's perspective. We will support you. We'll give you the resources. We'll give you the synchronicities but you have to show up fully mm -hmm. 
And if you don't, then no deal. You know, so it's that sort of understanding that I that I see. And I'm sure you may have felt the same way of like, you know that if you show up as your true authentic self and you confront your fears and you pursue your highest destiny, the support will be there. Yeah, it's it's all about this faith. Yes. It's, it's all about the devotion as well. Even if you don't entirely understand the devotion and what you're devoted to, it's just about this like, trust and the surrender that, yeah. And I feel like every person has that deal. Maybe deal is the wrong word, maybe agreement. Mm-hmm. There's an agreement with your higher self, with the divine, that we've got you. Mm-hmm. You've got this. The game you came to play, you will get to play it and we'll support you. Yeah. Yeah. There was something you said to me in the last podcast we did. The most powerful thing in my journey is being in complete devotion. Talk to me about spiritual devotion and your search for the divine, your search for God, your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. The, The conscious mind, the cognitive, the mental, the the masculine, it wants to make rules out of things. And we have been so conditioned by society to follow these man-made structures of their own. So it's, for me, the devotion is about deconditioning ourselves from these structures of society and realizing that there is something so far greater beyond us, that there is something that's such a web of intelligence, Mm. so smart and so beautiful and so profound and so complex that we don't need to even seek to understand it at all. So that encourages this, this faith, this understanding, this devotion. And the devotion for me means allowing ourselves to step into the role of leading the society back to knowing itself, back to experiencing itself for what it is, a man-made construct with such a greater intelligence beyond it. And for every individual to become aware of this greater force that is constantly there, that is constantly guiding us. And we can look at it as mycelia, as this interconnectedness between all humans as well, the energy, the way it flows between us, the way the veil is dropping and becoming thinner. And we're starting to realize that. And I think this is offering a lot of space for a complete surrender to the understanding that we are taken care of. And then we can still step up to all of it and still do all of our chores and still live up to whatever we need to live up to and grow because we want to grow coming from inspiration, not becoming coming from a place of like we have to. And also like working because we have to work versus working because we feel inspired to work. Yes. Drawing back on the manifestation piece from earlier, when we are working because we need to, when we're asking for certain things because we need them instead of asking for them because we feel inspired to have them and we feel inspiration to share them, this creates a really strong distinction of what will happen and what won't. If we grab onto these man-made constructs, then things just don't happen in our lives so easily, so effortlessly. We, we tend to, to have this kind of push-pull energy Always. Well, when we completely surrender, it's like going on a water slide and it just gets faster and faster. And we can just be in the devotion to the divine understanding that somebody built this water slide for us to enjoy. And for you personally, how has your relationship with the divine evolved over the last year? Over the last year, it hasn't evolved that much. I feel like my relationship with the divine is so strong it's, I I am a channel for it. And I'm realizing that that's what I am meant to be doing, what I'm meant to be. And let's say over the last five years, Mm -hmm. have you seen a deepening of that relationship? And what 
most helped you to to deepen that relationship the conscious understanding that that is what is happening definitely that was the difference and that was the deepening was understanding that that was always there that this faith was always there that since i was a little kid i had really coming from a very atheist family you know um where my grandma didn't even allow a cross in her house because of the socialist background of the politics of the country i'm from um so yeah coming from a very atheist background but yet still having so much faith that everything will always work out and that was something that was my my constant train of thoughts was like everything is going to work out when i got asked how are you going to travel the world with no money it's going to work out i'm being taken care of it's fine things are going to happen the way they happen and then going in different scenarios in different situations in different places um i i kept on having this complete faith for it and everything is always going to work out so i i acknowledge that that was always there and then deepening it was the process of recognizing like what is it that was always there actually what is this knowing like who do i actually trust what what is what is this entity or deity or being that is that is there and um what was the answer that you found there was no answer i i think it's it's a lot of different religious symbols that we see are embodiment of fractions of that and i think what is really the divine is this collective consciousness but actually quite far beyond that even so everything that we can perceive all these collective holograms kind of creating a shared heart shared reality and then going far beyond that realizing that that is still just a fraction of it yeah, every every step in our evolution of humanity is just a small fraction of it when we're starting to move towards this artificial intelligence for example that is also just a fraction of it and every every little every every object that we see every all the space that is there that is for me that is the divine is recognizing the sacredness in everything and in my journey through plant medicine through the feminine path of nature i've always looked at cities and technology as something that is ugly and gross that is a shadow and it took me quite a while to realize that cities are so geometrical if we look at them they're so structured they're so clean so such clean lines and we like to think like there's no clear lines in nature but if we look at beehives if we look at different geometrical positions of how different animals be de- build their habitats humans are no different we're just using different materials and then we do have this ability to like bring out the intelligence from the technology as well yes so this is like something that yes it might be the shadow for the earth what we are doing as a humanity to nature but as shadow is a part of the whole as well the same as within ourselves we accept the shadow so we can go further in the light that we can create this alchemy the same on a collective level the shadow is also a part of this alchemical process that we're moving through and on the spiritual level the spiritual shadow becomes the alchemical process of spiritual evolution and so the cities and the technology is equally as part of the divine as the nature and the beauty of the trees and the soil and the water exactly and it's funny i i remember clearly when i was tripping on mushrooms in vancouver it always comes back to mushrooms it's the mycelia it's the mycelia it always comes back to that yes and so i was I was tripping in Vancouver at my friend's place and it's downtown overlooking all of these skyscrapers. Mhm. And my favorite spot was to sit right by the window and watch how the city changed on the mushroom perspective. Mhm. And how beautiful actually the skyscrapers were and the the little cars, little tiny dots whizzing around and and it was like you could see the order and the beauty of that mm-hmm. as equally as you see the order and beauty in a, in a beehive yeah mm. jacob what are the core values that drive your life today 
the most important values to you. Devotion to evolution, devotion to growth, radical transparency, radical honesty, seeking truth, self-inquiry, pushing the limits and breaking the structures, mm, decolonizing my mind, and unconditioning the inner child and the curiosity. What does decolonize in my mind? It's it's taking away the the authority uh, authorities perceptions of what reality is and coming back to this innate wisdom that's been there before this takeover of the media and of other people's opinions started taking place mm -hmm. and going back to tech and technology what do you see is the link between ai and spirituality <laughs> let's start with the name web web3 web3 is this new emergence of all these different technologies. Web in itself is representing this, this matrix connecting all the dots. And when there was an emergence of internet, I'm sure there were people that thought it was the worst thing that could have ever happened. Mm. And yet now we see that we are just able to get so much connection to different methodologies, to different knowledge lineages, to, to all the information we know it lives on the internet at this point. We know... We live on the internet. <laughs> we, we live on the internet. Exactly. Whoever is wat watching this podcast is watching it through internet. So we have like all this limitless information available to us. I think Web3 is just a faster way of getting to all the information that we want. So artificial intelligence, the way it is looking now in its limited capacity, it's able to give us more accurate, more rapid information than any amount of Google searches we can do. So we can just ask a question and receive an answer based on all the que all the answers that are out there. So that might not be entirely verified all the time because it's drawing on all the answers that we can find there. But is it is definitely like faster and more intelligent than any other thing that we can do through searches. So right now we're seeing quite a lot of people rejecting that again because they're believing that by really starting to use AI, a lot of people are going to be losing jobs. It's going to, going to be taking away from people's experience. And I think that's true. And we can already see that happening. A lot of people are going to be losing jobs. But which kind of jobs are going to be lost first? Is people doing spreadsheets? People copywriting things? People drafting emails? Is this really what we're meant to be doing? I think AI is able to really do things more intelligently than the collective humanity can. It can become smarter and faster than any human out there. And if you're not playing with AI, you should. It's like starting with the internet when the internet started and not playing with it, just rejecting it. Like, oh, because it's new, I don't want to deal with it because I don't think it's like entirely beneficial in this way and I have my doubts, then I'm not going to play with it. But I promise in a year, in two years, you're going to be so far behind if you don't start using its intelligence. And then what it brings us to is the fact that we start doing more things that we are meant to be doing. And this is where the spiritual aspect of our interaction with it comes from, because if we live our lives making spreadsheets and writing notes, when there's a force that we've created that can do it in an instant, then how much of our free time is open up? 
And then we need to really ask ourselves collectively, what are we meant to be doing? If within the next year or two years, AI can do everything that a human can do on this tech side better than any human, then we have this collective identity crisis where we start wondering who are we and what are we here for? And I think this is such an exciting time to be alive because we're not just asking ourselves that when we're going through a midlife crisis or whatever. But now it becomes like a collective question of like, AI can do everything better in a year or two years. We're, we're still not there yet. But in a while, it's going to be able to do every single thing better, send better emails, better drafted, with better accent, with better tone, grammatically perfect. It's going to be able to write down all your social media things and post content for you better than any other social media manager that you have. What are you here to actually do? What are you meant to be doing? Do you think people are afraid of that existential question that if AI continues to advance as it is, and it's very likely that, that it will be able to do so many things much better, that you'll be forced to reckon with your own life and be like, why am I here? Yeah, you're, you're going to be, I think, with, with my projection and how this is taking place, I think, yes, there's going to be a lot of identity crisis happening. A lot of self-inquiry and looking at shadow aspects that people are not willing to look at. Because when all you do is numb, 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 all the time, this is actually the most exciting time because everyone is going to have to face that. Like, stop numbing. Stop doing the same work every day because somebody else is doing that now. It's a bit like they're bypassing right now of yeah. looking at that deeper question. Yeah, it's like bypassing spiritual evolution and just doing the chores. And collectively, I think that brings us to also realizing how the society is built and realizing that the structure that we have put on are not what's going to hold up. When dollar is being devalued, when the inflation is happening and we're seeing the dollar collapse, and that's going to happen as well in the next few years. The same we see with the structures that we thought were a bit more brilliant, such as more of a Web3 um, econ economy and cryptocurrency. We're also seeing that collapse because in a way they're also just man-made structures. So what is this, this brings a deeper question of like, what is the actual value? Like if we stop doing this exchange economics where we do spreadsheets for money and then we get paid in certain kind of currency, whether that's a dollar or a cryptocurrency. And we actually create systems where our own value is actually what is valued, like our innate value as human being. Yes. Human dot being. What, do you have an answer for yourself, a personal answer of what is our purpose here after AI takes over? What is the value that we are here to bring? No, I don't. But I'm so curious to see. I'm so excited for these next phases of wherever things go. And I know for myself, it's about playing in the journey. It's not about the end destination. I don't know what will happen in a few years. I have my ideas of where I see things going as I live with some of the key developers of Web3 right now in the world, as I actually talk to them, like on daily, by daily basis, I can see where the technology is moving. As I see some CEOs of really big companies starting to lay, um, lay out people. Lay off. Lay off people. Um, when they're starting to lay off people um, because they're starting to, introduce AI instead of that. I'm seeing like where, where this is going. And instead of like focusing on what is going to happen once we get there, I think my personal journey is all about the play around what is happening until we get to where we're going and actually being curious of seeing how the humanity as a whole, as a collective is going to react to that. I'm really curious to see what's going to be this like collective next step, the resolution for that. And um, I think it's a powerful tool that if we learn to utilize right now, we can play on such a high level. But at the end of the day, what is our life? 
we're in reality we're just playing if we look at our ancestors our our parents our grandparents years ago they had different kind of purpose in life they were working they were building towards something there it was very material they wanted to have a house they wanted to have you know children and like provide for those children now we have like completely different purposes it has shifted with the internet and this like personal branding creating everyone creating their own personal brand and their own identity as well online is just is just a very different play and it's such an exciting time to be alive because we play on such a high level now yes we get to experience how the world is going to have to inevitably reshape itself and we get to be a part of it mm. beautiful Jacob, is there anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to dive into? Just maybe to to finish this thought with um, with the emerging technology and spirituality. I think the most exciting part for me is to notice the awareness of people shifting towards common goals, where a lot of people are having similar let's call them downloads, similar ideas of how things should look and what's important to focus on right now. Yes, one torrent, yeah. many downloads, many seeds. Yeah, many many vortexes around the world as well, um, where people are actually realizing that this, this is their dharma, this is their purpose, and it's collective. It's not inv- individual. And this is creating this really beautiful decentralized web where everyone is focusing more for collaboration towards collaboration and less in competition and i've noticed this with a lot of people that i'm working with they all have their own things going on and they all have multiple different projects and then instead of us realizing that we're in competition we get together and realize all the meeting points and actually combine them together and then going further along that and then i have my own projects and i combine one with this person and one with the other person and it creates this web again it's like maybe web four the human web (laughs) i love that jacob what is your intention for the next time we meet for a podcast where would you like to see yourself in life and what evolution would you most love to experience in the next year i love how you just said that we're meeting in another year again seems seems pretty accurate um i would love a lot more people to become a part of this sangha Mm -hmm. this spiritual community Mm -hmm. for me my my goal is to really get this out there all the ways that we can co-create and encourage other people's sovereignty to take leadership and ownership on co-creating this reality So actually being a part of this web, not being a leader of it, but being a smaller part where all the other people are taking responsibility and actually co-creating this new earth. I think that is the vision I have, not just for myself, but for a lot of us. If you were to say one word that would describe your core intention for yourself, what would that word be? Devotion. Mm. Why devotion? Because devotion is, I think, where it all circles back to, is is the realization of the divine, is the realization of something greater than us. And then it's a full commitment to go towards that. So it's kind of all-encompassing for me, all-encompassing intention for everything we've just talked about. Building Sangha, creating Dharma. Also, you know, having these step-by-step systems and containers to actually go for that. It's like the devotion is the belief that I can get there and also knowing where I'm going. Jacob, what is one last piece of advice you'd like to leave the listener with? on how they can dive deeper into their devotion. Creating personal discernment. 
So whoever is listening to this, I, I deeply encourage you to start feeling into your heart. And I can make that very tangible if I have a minute. Um, if we look at our, our bodies, we know there's something called kinesiology testing, where we can test muscle testing, where we can test if there's a disease present or if there's a deficiency or something by muscle testing the body. And I encourage everyone to look this up if you don't know what I'm talking about. There's a thing that we have learned in theta healing and advanced pranic healing, which is a human pendulum where you start swaying your body from side to side and realizing what's a yes and what's a no for you. And one of my teachers, what he taught me years ago, um, was there, there's such a thing as a heart pendulum where imagine that your body, for some reason, you were not able to move it back and forth. And for some reason, you were not able to muscle test yourself. For some reason, you did not have a pendulum or somebody else telling you what's a yes and what's a no. If for some reason you didn't have your mental mind, your cognitive functions to make rational decisions based on pros and cons, what would you use? And he taught me a technique of really feeling into my heart and asking myself, is this a yes or is this a no? And this is the purest form of discernment where we actually go so deep within our soul, within our higher self and without how our body is moving or what our mind is thinking, actually feel into what is right for us. And in my, my advice for anyone on the spiritual journey would be to not follow what everyone else is doing, mm. not follow what they're being told is the right thing, not blindly obey what is being told by some sort of an authority, whether that's a teacher or a parent, or, or whatever, um, but actually to feel in the heart, like what is actually true for me right now? Yeah. What do I believe in? What do I want to devote my life to? So it's not one pointed focus towards a specific God, but it is one pointed focus in this devotion to whatever is like our higher calling. Mm. The heart knows. The heart knows. Jacob, thank you so much. It's been a beautiful conversation and I'm so honored to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a big pleasure every time. Mm. You've been listening to The James Zander Trip with Jacob Grichar. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I hope it inspired you, uplifted you. If you can do me one favor is share this conversation with one friend who you think might benefit from this podcast. I think at this time in our life, we need more deep conversations like this and it would mean the world to me if you shared it with one friend you can find the podcast on apple spotify youtube and all your favorite podcast platforms thank you so much for listening and i'll see you next time